for ground improvement. It's what we do. A good geotechnical engineer will be called in when there's a difficult site. The contractor will say, help. And you will just kind of dig around your toolkit. Your toolkit usually doesn't start getting built till your first couple of years out of school. When you're on job sites, you're seeing things for the first time. You're like, oh, we never talked about that in school. That's kind of cool. And uh, we've just really kind of grazed through a lot of the topics when it comes to geotechnical engineering. If you're going to consider going on and becoming a geotechnical engineer, I strongly suggest getting a master's degree. That's really where you, where you can dive into these classes. You can take advanced soil mechanics, advanced foundations, earthquake engineering. And that's where you really start to understand soils, how they behave, pavement design. How would you design a asphalt or a concrete pavement over a clay? You know, how thick will you need it to be? Or what can you put in there to you know, help those spread out the load? That's what it's all about being a geotechnical engineer. You've got some load that's going into the soil. How can you spread it out? So that soil, because every soil has its personality and it can, it has a bearing capacity. Once you overcome that bearing capacity, it'll start to settle, it'll slide, it'll, it will fail. And um, that's what we're trying to prevent. How to reduce loads by spreading it out or there's even improvement techniques that we can do. How can we improve the soil, that's what we'll hear about next week. And then piles and drilled shafts, how can we skip those bad layers? Maybe they're in the first 50 feet, 100 feet. How can we skip over those and take that load and skip, skip, skip all the way down to some good layer? So those are the concepts that we're covering. Today we're gonna to be covering drilled shafts for the first time. We've been talking about piles, driving in steel, driving in wood, driving in concrete piles. And now we're gonna talk about not driving at all. Driving is noisy. It creates vibration. It sometimes in certain soils, it puts too much lateral stress on the sides of the soil. And um, we, we, anyway, there's a lot of problems with piles. Sometimes you're not close to deliver a pile. They have to be typically delivered on big trucks or maybe you can cast some concrete piles on site, but there's all kinds of problems with piles. Piles are the most common but they still have, I mean, if you're in a dense area, no one wants to hear a pile driving hammer. So drilled shafts are the answer. Drilled shafts are, um, they're great. They probably have more advantages than piles, but they take a little bit more skill. So unless there's any more, is there any more questions on housekeeping, where we're headed? This Friday, you'll have an hour and a half. You'll be able to come to class a little bit early, maybe 15 minutes early stay a little bit late to do our final exam. And the exam will be on piles, drilled shafts, pile groups, pretty much three questions. <clears throat> so that's where we're headed. So today, what are all those advantages of drilled shafts? That's what we want to talk about. Um, <clears throat> where would you prefer to use them or not? What are different types of drilled shafts? Construction, how does it even go in the ground? What would you be looking for? If you were called to be an inspector as an EIT of a drilled shaft installation project, what are some of the critical things you need to be looking out for? Loading mechanisms, okay, so you got a drilled shaft. How does it take that load at the top and transfer it to the sides, down to the base? What's going on there? And we wanna figure out how to calculate in the end, the total load bearing capacity of a drilled shaft. So there's a couple of names for drilled shafts. There's a lot of names for many of the things that we do, but if you hear of caissons, piers, a drilled pier, drilled shaft, it's all the same thing. And they all refer to cast in place, piles with diameters approximately two and a half feet or more. I mean, they can get pretty big. There's a video that I wanna show you of a 24 foot diameter drilled shaft. That's just incredible. I've personally seen some up to 10 feet on the project that I was on in uh, Phoenix, we did 600 drilled shafts, typically underneath the uh, bridge abutments, right before the bridge goes over. We did a lot of drilled shafts. And um, so a drilled shaft that is defined as a drilled or excavated hole filled with concrete. Pretty simple. And you may include these reinforcing stills. So here's a picture of a drilled shaft All right at the top. Could be 50, 100 feet, 150 feet long. Um, but after they drill out the hole, then they fill it with concrete and, and rebar to handle the loads. So 
If you have a lot of lateral loads, you, mean, you need a lot more steel. If you just have compressive loads, you can get away with very little steel. So the types of expected load conditions determine how much steel that you need. So what are some advantages? There's a lot of advantages when it comes to drilled shafts. Um, you can use a single drilled shaft, a big old one, instead of a lot of little driven piles. The project that I was talking about last week where I was inspecting these piles getting driven in to hold up these big uh, air tanks, they were very, they were close to very, they were spaced very close together. And if you wanted just to avoid the hassle of all these piles, you know, two, three feet uh, center to center, why not consider a big drilled shaft? They're easier to install in dense sand and gravel than a driven pile. You can imagine it's very difficult to drive a pile through gravel. It just will resist it too much. And if you have a timber pile, the, the top end will broom and it will destroy it. So a drilled shaft <clears throat> can actually drill through all that gravel, no problem. And you can construct them before grading. Sometimes if you're driving a pile, you have to level the site. Well, when it comes to a drilled shaft, you can drill it down and then you can stop the concrete at whatever level that the future end uh, grade is going to be at. Whether it's higher or lower, you can control it really easily because you construct the drilled shaft on site with liquid concrete. So it's very easy to change and set that elevation. No vibration. Um, there's also no heaving or those lateral pressures that are being pushed into the soil. Sometimes you use piles, driven piles, to densify the soils. Well, sometimes densifying the soils is problematic because the soil might be too weak to handle that densification. So um, there's no heaving either. Uh, there's no hammer noise, but people like this. There's just the noise of the equipment drilling the hole, not too bad. In large bases, so a pile has a tip and that tip is set. It can't be changed once you start driving the pile. However, with a drilled shaft, once you get to the bottom of your shaft, you can bail out the bottom and create a bigger end bearing diameter than you have in the shaft. So there's actually two diameters in a drilled shaft. There's a shaft diameter, and then there's the base diameter, which could be bigger if you bail out your end. And you can imagine a bigger bell end, a bigger area, you can hold more loads. So there's a lot of end bearing capacity on drilled shafts. Uh, and it can be inspected. They're pretty big. You can send people down these holes. They're two, three, four, 10 feet, 20 feet in diameter. You can send a crew down in there. They can expect, they can look for slough. They can make sure it's level, that the bell is properly installed. So uh, people can physically, visually, you can send a camera down and inspect the bottom of these drilled shafts. They have high resistance to lateral loads. With all that steel that you're able to put in them, they can be very rigid and they could handle a lot of the lateral loads. Like you can imagine a big windmill it has a lot of lateral loads from that wind. And so that would be an ideal situation to use, to, to use a drilled shaft. Insulation equipment is more mobile, which is typically more economical. Um, you, a drilled shaft is typically on a tracked wheel that can go out there on any types of soil conditions, hillsides, swamp lands, and you can just start drilling into the ground. So anyway, those are a lot of the advantages, there's more. So what kind of drilled shafts are there? There's straight shafts. There are these belled ends that I was talking about. You can have them kind of be conical or parabolic shaped, or you can have them to be a big cone shape in the end. And so you anchor them down and typically stop once you get to some good hard soil. You can also anchor them, socket them into rock if you uh, so desire. So there's just a couple different options that you can um, these are just four of the types, the main, these are the main ones. Most of the drilled shafts that I've seen lately are these um, straight shafts, they're the most common. Yeah, there's a lot of different, uh, little, a lot of different methods. So how does this all work? So you can imagine that when you're drilling into the soil, you can encounter quite a few different situations. You could have all clay and no water table, all sand and no water table. But as soon as you start to get a water table when you're drilling a hole, it's like what you experience when you're at the beach, digging a hole close to the waves. As soon as you get down a certain distance and hit that water table, the sides of that sand, they slough in so easily. And that would be very frustrating if you're drilling a drilled shaft. And so what do you do to prevent that? You would probably send down this sleeve or they call it a casing that would go down your hole as you're drilling it out, you're sliding a casing down in it and it would protect from that slough. So 
Here's one method where there's no slough, there's no water table. It's a nice hole that can hold itself open. You would uh, have this drill rig, it would drill down a couple feet, then it would pull up all those loose cuttings from drilling, and then it would spin its auger, shake them all off. Then it would go back down the hole, drill another one or two feet, come back out. It's, it's very repetitive. In the hole, drill down a couple feet, bring it out, shake off the auger, because it's just like a big screw auger, just like this picture that's going down. And all that loose soil that those teeth are grinding up, they're held. And so then you just bring it up, move it off to the side, spin it really quick, all the dirt flies off, and you just keep going down to whatever depth that you need. And so then you can fill it up with concrete. You can drop your cage in while there's a little bit of concrete. It kind of then you sits in there, and then you can use the crane to raise and lower exactly where you need that cage rebar to sit, fill it all the way to the rest of the way with concrete, and then it's done. Non-caving soil, this is how you'd construct a drilled shaft. And you could do a couple of these in a day, depending on how deep it is. So it's re relatively quick. Now, you got water. Water is a problem. Water that gets into the hole typically causes those sides. There's, they're just held up by their own you know, cohesion or the friction angle of the sand. They're just held up. They're, they're, they're typically not very um, stable. So what do you do? Well, if you're drilling into some cohesive soil and you get into a water table, you can add what's called a drilling slurry. Has anyone ever drilled out and used a drilling slurry? Does anyone have experience with this? I've seen it for boring. You've seen it for borings? Yeah, very similar. So when you're when you're boring using like a hollow stem auger, is that what you've seen, Adam? Um, no, this was, uh, they used more like a spoon and kind of just pushed through, but they had okay. to lubricate it and it had a lot of uh, bentonite in it to hold the, the their path open after they removed their drill bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've used a lot of drilling slurries in my uh, experience. I used a lot of them downtown Salt Lake City when they were building City Creek. As we were drilling down, we had to pump our hole full of this drilling mud. And it was made, we had a big water tank on site with us. And then we dumped these dry bags of bentonite powder in it. And it just densified and made the specific gravity of that liquid that we were creating, that mud slurry, uh, denser than water. So what happened is the soil has felt the weight of water kind of holding it up. As soon as you create a hole in there, if you quickly fill that hole with something a little denser than water, that hole doesn't slough in or cave. And so a drilling slurry is ideal. And sometimes that drilling slurry is all you need. Even when you go through these soils that have a tendency to cave, if it's like a loose sand layer or something down below the ground, if you have a drilling slurry, those walls stay up. But if they start, caving in even too much, even after your drilling slurry, then you're gonna to need to add a cage, a big tube, a steel tube, a sleeve, a case, and you're gonna to need to case that hole. And the case doesn't have to run the entire length of the shaft. It, if you know like a certain layer, maybe there's 10 feet of this sand, then you just need to lower this casing down to that zone to hold back that sloughing sand. And then when you get into this picture right here, there's some cohesive soils here and here. So your casing would just need to run just you know, a little bit past this caving soil area. And so you add the casing to the hole in the caving section, uh, you pump out the slurry, and then you just keep going. And the casing, it kind of gets in your way, and so sometimes you have to use a little bit smaller auger to go down through that. Um, but then it works the same way. Once you get to the level that you need, you go ahead and fill it up with um, concrete, and then you can start pulling that casing out as you're filling it up with concrete, because as concrete it gets to that zone it's even denser than the slurry that we're using so nothing should cave in and then you just once you have a head of concrete up here above this caving soil area then you pull out that sleeve and everything stays put and you go ahead and put your rebar in as needed and you're done so it's a little bit more complicated i've seen this quite a bit a lot of casings that we used in arizona were down by the riverbed because we were building a bridge to go over that river and so we had a water table and so a lot of the drilled shafts were cased and uh, you can reuse that casing again and again. You slip it in, drill down to depth, fill it back up with concrete, pull out when the concrete's wet. So there's a lot going on when you're pulling the concrete in. I mean, you're, you're pulling out the casing, you're lowering down a rebar. So you got a couple cranes sometimes helping you out to get it done. But uh, it's a little complicated, but you can still go quite quick. Once the crew has done these again and again, they get a, a repetition and get pretty fast at it. Uh, slurry method. When you're using all slurry, then you just, again, you fill up the hole with slurry, which is just a 
you're just adding clay to water, powdered clay to water, and it just makes it a little bit denser. And it's just, it just looks like mud. And it's not like super viscous. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, it, it almost looks just like water, but it just, it's a little bit heavier. <clears throat> so I don't know, water weighs 62 pounds per cubic foot. Maybe this stuff weighs 70 pounds per cubic foot, but um, you just fill up your hole um, with this drilling slurry. And again, you um, put your cage in, and then sometimes you get this concrete down in here. How do you get concrete to fall from the chute of the truck down into this wet slurry? I mean, that, you can just imagine that would just be a mess. And so what they do sometimes is they have a pump truck. And so this concrete is dumped out into this pump truck that has this long hose. And then you, you bring the hose all the way down here. And then as you start pumping in concrete at the bottom and filling it up, it starts pushing that drilling mud up out. And then you collect it with some type of sump pump over here and pump. Otherwise it just pours out on everybody's feet and this makes the construction site really easy. But you just have a little hose that kind of comes in right here. And as that concrete flows up, it's denser and all that lighter drilling mud gets sucked away and, and pumped off into a sump pump or something like that. And then you insert your cage into that wet concrete and you're good to go again. So that's how you make a drilled shaft, pretty straightforward. Any questions about that? Well, let's watch in real life how this looks. So I've got a video. Can you see that YouTube page I just slid over there? Okay, let's watch this real quick, just for like two minutes. We're in Auburn, Alabama on a drill shaft project. The project is eight foundations for a condominium that's going up here in Auburn. We've got temporary shoring going in and then uh, two phases of drilled shaft work. We've got 22 shafts on the first phase and 150 on the latter phase. My name is Dennis Smith. I'm a superintendent for Russo Corporation. The three basic foundation technologies that we use are anchored earth, drilled shafts, and micropiles. In this case, we're using drilled shafts as a deep foundation for the condominiums going up. The way a drilled shaft works is it transfers a load from a structure above to a bearing strata below, kind of like a, a column in the dirt. The rated capacity for the piers is about 700,000 pounds, or about 54 elephants, or 20 Greyhound buses. So a, a drill shaft or a caisson is a uh, cylinder ranging from 18 inch to 13 foot diameter where we use the auger bit to drill to a certain depth anywhere from 5, 10, 120 to 200 feet deep. All the dirt and rock material will come out of the hole and produce a round cylinder to fill with a circular rebar cage and fill with concrete all the way from the bottom to the top. This is a Solmec SR45 drill rig. They're made in Italy. Rotary driven drill rig powered by Kelly Bar and the rotary. Upwards of 100,000 foot pounds of torque. To correlate torque, uh, your normal everyday pickup truck, your engine produces around 300 to 400 foot-pounds of torque. And this machine produces upwards of 100 to 120,000 foot-pounds of torque in the rotary to turn the Kelly bar and drill the shaft uh, as deep as you need it. This is a 48-inch uh, rock auger with carbide teeth. When we start pouring the shaft, once we drill it down, we got to get the right depth, the right elevation. Then we got to get with the engineers to give me the right concrete elevation, the right steel elevation. So what I started doing, I started pouring without putting the steel in, it was a floating cage. So when I get so much in there, then I stop. Then I reach it back, grab the steel, put it in the hole, and let him shoot it. Give me the right elevation. I let the crane hold the steel. I start back pouring concrete. I get enough concrete in there to stabilize the steel. I cut the steel loose. Then I come on up to the right elevation, and that's the hole. First recorded drill shafts in North America were put in under the Brooklyn Bridge. And back then, they had to dig them by hand, and it would, could take up to several months to put one shaft in. Now, with the technology we've got, we're able to do multiple shafts per shift or even as, as fast as one every five or 10 minutes. I got into this business as a part-time job out of college and 13 years later. All right, that was pretty good. What'd you guys think about that? That's a drilled shaft, that's real life. That's exactly how it happens. That soil must've been pretty soft if they can put one in every 10 minutes. Yeah, look, you, you see that? It looked really fine grain clay. I didn't see any sand, I didn't see any gravel. The hole looks like it held itself open. They didn't have to use any casing. It just was like a really tight, stiff clay. That, that was awesome. That was like the ideal situation. And that's pretty much um, 
some of the guidelines that you would use, like should we use piles? Should we use drilled shafts? You have to think about these things. How well is the hole gonna stay open if we have to use casing? If there's a water table, then maybe we should just use piles. So um, yeah, I really like that. I know it was quick, but that's, that's what's going on. You'll probably be an EIT that will go out on the field and you'll inspect, you'll inspect to make sure that they get the deep enough, the elevation. You heard he kept talking about elevation. You need the toe of that base to bear where they said it was going to bear. So the elevations are critical. So as an engineer, you're going to be dropping a little line down there, a little plumb bob, a little string with a weight attached to it all the way to the bottom. And then you're going to, once it hits, then you're going to record that. And then you're going to see, okay, that's how deep we hit our depth. And it needs to be accurate. Um, you'll check for plumbness, how straight they are. Make sure the, your little line drops all the way to the bottom without hitting anything. You can shine a big heavy duty floodlight down in the hole and you can, you can actually see quite a ways down the hole, 50, 60 feet, sometimes a little bit more. You can see if there's any sloughing on the sides as you visually inspect it. The diameter of the hole that he was doing, he said it was four feet in diameter. That's pretty big. I mean, you can get close to the edge. Most people have to tie off with harnesses so no one falls in, but you can visually look into these holes to see if they're good. I want to show one more video that I was very impressed with. A large diameter. Can you see this new video that I just threw in there? You're not going to believe how big this is. I still can't believe. There's really no sound. I'm going to turn the sound off. Now you can't hear any more sound, right? Check this out. This is enormous. Let me slow it down a little bit. All right, it looks fast, but it's sped up anyway. So they're gonna drill out the middle of this right here, but in order to drill them, I mean, this is a 24 foot diameter hole. And in order to drill the hole out, they're first going around and drilling mini drilled shafts. Look at all these mini drilled shafts. The purpose of these is to create a perimeter that will hold up so there's no sloughing. So there was no casing big enough to, for this hole. I mean, this casing you see right here, that's only like four feet tall. After, after that, all those drilled shafts, I don't know how many there was, like 12, 20, something like that. But those, and they've, they've already covered it up and they're creating a platform. This is an enormous hole. And um, they created this concrete platform. All around this perimeter are all those other drilled shafts. They're gonna prevent the wall from coming in. But they're starting with a smaller diameter. I mean, small, that's like 10 feet in diameter right there. That looks huge. And they're just going down and they're slowly getting wider and wider. You can see them put on a bigger one. Look how big that one is. This is an enormous drilled shaft. You will probably never see a drilled shaft like this. And if you do, take some pictures and send them to me because I'd love to share in the next class. I mean, look at the size of that. So it only can go down like a foot at a time. It spins around, I mean, with some amazing amount of torque. And it, put, and it but then it, once it fills up the uh, that little bucket, he has to bring it up spin it out and then that loader comes and pushes away so he goes down and up down and up i mean it's very repetitive and they just keep augering it out bigger and bigger each time i mean that is enormous 24 foot diameter drilled shaft anyway, I'm, I'm impressed it's, i mean you can imagine the torque on this machine the machine that we saw in the previous video had 120,000 pounds of torque i mean a thousand pounds more than your vehicle i think this is the biggest size right here so they, part of the reason they poured that pad was just to hold up that machine. So did they pour yeah, that pad in? Now, but uh, that holy smokes, that hole can, it can hold up a lot of weight. I wish I knew the details on this hole, what its capacity was, millions of pounds that this drilled shaft will be able to hold. Anyway, we'll pause right there. But uh, I thought that was very impressive. That's gonna take a lot of concrete to fill up. <clears throat> so um, yeah, look at this machine right here, the torque that it can put on this bar. I don't know, 200,000 pounds, 300, I don't know. This looks significantly larger than the machine that was in the first video. Any comments about that? So do you think part of the reason they poured that pad was just to hold up that rig? Yeah. I think it's all temporary. I doubt the structure that's going to be going on here even needs this pad at all. I mean, the new structure that's going to go on here, it doesn't need, I mean, there's a whole ring of drilled shafts around here keeping the soil from sloughing in, didn't need that. So some projects are so big 
You could spend up to a million dollars of just temporary form work and bracing and a leveling pad just to get your heavy duty equipment in. And then you take it all down and I can't even imagine what's gonna go right here. Wish I knew. Anyway, well, you're, if you, oh, go ahead. Well, that's one of my questions is why would you ever need a, a drill shaft that big? Like what, because you're not putting anything around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, that's why I wish I knew what this was. I mean, there, this may be an extension of some factory. They had to put in some mega piece of equipment or something like that. And it had to be right here. Maybe like I mean, a tower or something? This, what's that? Maybe a tower or something? Yeah, maybe some huge tower is going right there. And it had to go right there. And so in that case, you'd spare no expense. I mean, if you have to get it there, then you do what it takes. So... I mean, I think if there was other alternatives, they would have taken it because this is so expensive to get one shaft in right here. But there was probably some very expensive, precise piece of equipment that could tolerate no settlement and had enormous loads. So, yeah, that, that was just impressive. So do they typically just do drilled shaft in really soft soil or because all these ones we've seen so far it's it looks like yeah. you know really nice fine it's, it's actually the the two ends of the extremes it's the really soft and then the really dense because the really dense you can't drive a pile in it so and you can and you can it's all a spectrum it's sometimes you're in a big city like where we were we were in phoenix there's a lot of contractors in phoenix they had a lot of equipment and they were competitive bidding against each other and so we got a really low price for a crew to come in and for pretty much two years straight, installed these 600 drilled shafts. And they had one or two pieces of equipment going, you know, around the clocks. So we had to have three engineers out there watching it. And, um, but if you were in a remote area, didn't have a lot of uh, contractors bidding on your project, then, you know, maybe this would work, maybe it wouldn't, because wouldn't, of mobilization costs, getting it in. But um, anyway, it, it all depends. But uh, big cities typically have, uh, a downtown area and those skyscrapers are typically held up with drilled shafts and so there's a lot of um, construction capacity there's that skill set it takes a skilled crew to do something like this and if you're in, in an area like a small town like Rexburg I doubt we have a contractor in Rexburg that has a drilled shaft crew on standby ready to do all the construction that we're going to do in Rexburg I mean that's not here we'd have to call Salt Lake Malcolm Drilling they have a crew they'd mobilize four hours up here and they would do our drill shafts project and then move out to some other community. So it, it really just depends on the labor market and who's in town. But I know Salt Lake has a couple drill shaft crews like Nicholson Construction, Malcolm. Those two compete each other uh, heavily for um, big foundation work like this. Okay, drill shafts. Um, this is just a suggestion. It, um, so the design strength of your concrete, um, whatever it is, for if you're using 4,000 PSI concrete, um, they're saying use you know a fourth of it. I mean the drilled shaft, it's it's so massive, it doesn't. Um, I mean there's equations you can actually there's actually another portion of this equation that uh, helps you figure out. Um, the strength of the concrete you need uh, based off your working load and the, the area of your drilled shaft. So there's a couple of equations that will help you um, design your drilled shafts. <clears throat> but this is probably the most important. How does a drill shaft work? Um, how does that load come in here at the very top? It's coming down. How does this transfer, transfer through the soil? So it's interesting that in order to get capacity, bearing capacity out of your drilled shafts, you need the shaft to settle a little bit. If the shaft doesn't settle at all, it doesn't have time to kind of grip and lock into the soil as it's sliding down. It needs to settle, not a lot, but a little bit. This is a really cool graph. It shows you the total settlement. Here's, here's, here's a pile, and they started applying a load a little bit at a time, and it didn't move at all. They applied load, 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 load. This is the total line you should look at first. It held a little above 1,200 kilonewtons. That's a lot. Um, and it, this is the settlement in millimeters. So at six millimeters, I mean, it, 
it had only settled like, what is six millimeters? That's not a lot. That's like a quarter of an inch, like a couple, like three quarters stacked onto each other. But it had settled six millimeters and it was almost holding 80, 90% of the total load. I mean, this is the total maximum load right here. And at six millimeters, it had almost maxed out. That's amazing. And interestingly, this is this was a, an experiment that was done by Reese in 1976. And he had instruments all over this pile, like little load cells on the bottom, on the side. And he could tell uh, how much of that load, this total load that was coming down, how much was being held up by the sides and how much was being held up by the base. And what's interesting to note here is the sides, they hold up much more than the base at this six millimeters. At six millimeters, the contribution of the total settlement right here is based on the side friction plus the, the base, the end bearing capacity of that. And you can see there's hardly any base capacity that's been engaged after six millimeters of settlement. However, all of the side has pretty much maxed out. So the side friction engages first and holds all that. And then as it starts to scrape down, you know, that skin friction between the rough edges of the concrete and that drilled shaft soil, then it's, it, I mean, it can, it's like your claws on the chalkboard. You can only grip until they start sliding, and, but there is some grip. And it's saying all that grip was engaged and then the base had to kick in and then it started holding up load. And uh, as it settled 12 inches and 18 inches, that's really when the base started getting engaged, but then it even topped out. And then it failed through punching that shear failure. And then you could see just the total loads just totally dropped off. The side friction had been, um, completely mobilized, the bearing capacity at the base had been completely used up, and then your pile fails. And you can see that the load just drops off. So this is how a pile behaves. And one more, so I want you to focus on this bottom graph right here. This is also explains how a pile behaves. So this is the load. And so you can kind of pause it and at 400, I mean, this totally, this held about 1200 kilonewtons total. So about, uh, at, at 400, <clears throat> he checked all his instruments and he realized there was 400 loads pressing down right here at the top. However, if he had a little scale down at the bottom, it was filling this load right here. So this is depth in meter. The, the load, the, the total, it was about seven meters total for this pile. And so right here where the pile end, this 400 load at the top was only being recorded down at the bottom. Like, what is that? I mean, that's less than a hundred. I mean, 80% of that load had been transferred to the side of the pile. It hadn't made it down to the base. And only once they got up, after about six millimeters, there was maybe, what is this? A thousand, a little over a thousand kilonewtons. That's when the bearings, that's when down here started, that little scale down here really started going off. And so the load, it kept going up there, you know, 800 kilonewtons at the surface, all of that load had been transferred to the side and hardly any had made it down. So it's really dependent on settlement. And I, I like these charts because it kind of explains the, the progression as that load is being applied to your drilled shaft and how the side friction first tries to take all that load and lets very little of it go down to the bottom. But then after you exceed that side friction capacity, then the bottom of your pile has to take over. And you can see once they got close to failure, then at that point, there was still quite a bit that had made it down. But in the end, it looks like side friction held way more than the, almost by double than the base for this particular uh, drilled shafts. And that's how piles work too. They all have the same uh, mechanism of transferring a load. And it's complicated, it's not 100%, but this is in general how it works. And so it's a combination of side friction and base friction, but they engage at different times to, to hold up your load. Any questions about how this, this load transfer mechanism works? So will they ever change, um, like especially with a drilled shaft, you can control what the shape of your hole is. Do they ever put ridges and stuff in along the sides of a, a drilled shaft mm -hmm. hole? That's a good question. Yeah, you're like, hey, what if we put like little fins in here, right? Maybe we could have a little bit more capacity. Well, I think what they do is instead of getting creative on the side, I've never heard of fins like uh, intermediate, but they, they can really bell out this end down here. I mean, they could, they could really ream out that bottom and then you can get a lot more uh, capacity. Then when all the side shear skin friction has been used up, then you can keep going. And then at the base would just kind of keep going and going and going like that. 
and um, your total load would also kind of match it and keep going in that direction. So that's a good question. I mean, wow, what if you didn't install little fins? Could that help? I don't know. I think it would take some creative equipment. And then the main thing is once you design something like this, you have to inspect and, and prove and verify and validate that it actually is doing what you think. And those are just more opportunity windows to get something wrong. And so they try to keep it as simple as possible. And this is about as simple as you can get a straight shaft and then complicate just a little bit more with a bell then. Also, you'd probably have to have like perfect soil to be able to pull that off. So it went all just slough off. Right, because exactly. Soil isn't like being in tension. You can imagine any of the soil kind of under this that's been reamed out would kind of just slough off and fall down. Same with this. That's why you typically have uh, belt ends like this. They're not drastic like that because they're hoping there's a little bit of cohesion and that that soil doesn't just fall in and cave in at the bottom. And they usually have pre-drilled this and already sampled the soil with like a SPT spoon sampler. And they know that this soil has a little bit of cohesion that, be able, can, that can handle this belled shape, something like that. So typically always before a drilled shaft goes in, there's been a lot of geotechnical work beforehand so that you have a good sense that your design is gonna work out. Okay, this is where it gets fun. How much can this shaft hold? Well, this should look very familiar to us from last week. The ultimate load, is based off the, the end bearing, the tip, and then the skin friction on the side. So let's talk about the, the end bearing first, that tip. Well, it's all based off of the area. And then what is this? What does this look like? What is, what, we've seen this before, started in chapter three. What is that? Bearing capacity for soil. Yes, this is Trizaghi's bearing capacity of the soil. And a drilled shaft, you know, it was like a small foundation, a shallow, you know, it's a footing resting on the soil. And we were able to calculate how much a little footing could hold on soil using Terzaghi's bearing capacity equation. And it has three components to it. Whoa, that's a two. Cohesion, if the soil has cohesion, then it's got these, the, uh, the soil um, you know, modification factors and it has shape and depth and size and all these other different kinds of factors to add on to it. Um, then the second component, that's all based on the depth. So this is all based on the unit weight of the soil and then the depth that it is in the ground. Because the deeper the soil is in the ground and the more load is on the soil, those particles are pushed together. They have way more strength. When soil is under pressure, it has strength. And that's what this is all about, the depth and then the unit weight of the soil. And then this um, component right here, this um, also has the unit weight in it. And this is a bearing capacity factor based off of um, this whole component is, what is it? It's based off of the size of your footing. And uh, we normally just toss this one out because I mean, while a drill shaft is big and we just saw a 24 foot diameter drill shaft go in, um, uh, we usually uh, assume that that's just um, zero right there. And so then typically the only two terms that you have um, to figure out when it comes to this QP right here are the cohesion that's in the clay and then just what's your depth and the unit weight of the soil. And then QS, that's just from right up here. So your total is based on the area and then you multiply it by all these fun little factors right here and you can figure them out. Um, and then that is the ultimate bearing capacity of your pile. So let's kind of, let's talk about some of these. They're in the book. There's a lot of good tables to use. Someone, I like this table a lot, table 12.1 in the book. This is a cool one because not only does it have uh, many of these factors that we just saw in the previous equation, um, but they're all based off of the, the friction angle. So if you know the friction angle of your soil, you can come in this chart and you can start popping off some of these um, factors that you, that you need. And then some of these other um, modification factors, they're based off of some of these other values right here. And so uh, table 12.1 is, is kind of a workhorse. It has a lot of the values in it um, that you're gonna need. But you're gonna need a couple other tables as well. Um, C, that was in the previous table that we looked at. Um, but these are, the, these are the F factors that are calculated from. There's three equations that you're gonna need. Um, but in the end, some of these um, 
these factors, they're typically all based off soil properties. And they typically all end up being related to the friction angle of the soil. I don't know if you've picked up on a theme here, but when it comes to geotechnical engineers, if they had to base an equation off some soil property, the one that they're 90% most likely to base that soil property off of is friction angle. And the lab test that gives you friction angle is the direct shear test. And not many labs do that, it's kind of funny. Um, but but the, the friction angle of the soil could be correlated from many, many things. Even the, the N60, the, the N value, the SPT blow counts, you can correlate to a friction, friction value. So, and sometimes the friction values are given as a component of the friction and the friction between the soil and uh, the concrete. And that's what these, um, that value is right there. Uh, there's a rigidity index that you'll need to calculate. Again, there's just, there's a uh, another equation for that one. The only other tip about this, sometimes if you see, um, if you have to calculate tangent and you have to put in a uh, value right here, the main thing to remember is it needs to be in radians and not degrees. So if you calculate all this out and your calculator is not in radiant mode, you will get the incorrect inverse tangent value when you're trying to calculate your FQD. So there's, there's quite a few factors. The equation looks kind of hairy, but you've done this before. You just find the correct table and then you can calculate what all of these different F factors are. Um, rigidity index, what's that? That's just another, some other researchers thought, you know what? <clears throat> when it comes to calculating the bearing capacity of a, uh, a drilled shaft, I think we need to use a rigidity index. And he was able to correlate rigidity index with a couple other soil properties. Uh, again, you can still see he uses um, the friction angle of the soil, but he wanted to use you know, a drain modulus of elasticity. Now that's a very um, rare, I mean, it's a soil property, but it's not used very much. You know? What's the modulus elasticity of the soil? I don't know, I've never calculated it. Um, and so what they do is they, they try to estimate it. Okay, it's just M times the uh, atmospheric pressure. Well, what's M again? A lot of estimations going in right here. Uh, M can be two to 500 between medium and uh, to dense soil. So um, don't get hung up on you know the meaning of all this. What, what this is is someone conducted maybe 50 drilled shaft tests in the field and pushed all of them until they failed. And then they probably had you know, a plot and it, of all the 50 tests that they did, they probably had some you know, scatter plot and they had to fit some fit line through that. And from that fit line, it probably had a bunch of these, um, they were able to kind of back calculate a lot of these um, rigidity indexes and that's where they all come from. So this is empirical relations and it was all based on real world tests. So that's where they come from. Any questions about kind of how to calculate the bearing capacity of a drilled shaft? The book has some good examples in it for your homework. I just suggest just following that. It's not tricky. There's not too many um, conditions like there was with piles. With piles, we had 12 different guys and all their different methods. Here we just have one or two methods. It's not um, as complex. But these slides just kind of walk you through what all the different variables are. Uh, there's another table that you can use to calculate. Again, we're, we're trying to figure out, well, what is the ultimate bearing capacity? It's going to be equal to the, the tip. Wow. Shouldn't even drawn anything. And the skin resistance. And this is another method to figure out that tip resistance. It's just another, another researcher ran some tests. And so a little bit simpler. What do you do here? Again, it's the area multiplied by the, the load. This is the, um, what the, the soil can handle. Um, and we, we calculated Q in when we came to pile capacity. This is just the pile capacity of, of the soil. And then when you put in, when you take into account the area, that's when you get big Q. Big Q is your total uh, load. 
And then they just multiply it with some, again, some soil modification factors. You can figure out NQ from this table 12.2, or you can figure out this value from this table right here. And the only thing to remember when you're looking at these different tables, uh, like we talked about yesterday, there was two different L's. Sometimes there's the length of the shaft, the total length of the shaft and or, or pile, and then the length and where the, um, the increased friction, you don't get any more um, capacity out of it. So there was those charts that we talked about. And it's important to remember that as you go deeper and deeper, you can get more and more friction out of your soil, but at some point it kind of levels off and just comes straight down. And so there's two lengths. Well, there's two different Ds. And in the book, you'll find there's the diameter of the shaft, there's DS and there's DB. And so DB is just typically larger. So if you have a shaft that comes down and then it bells out at the end, the diameter down here is DB. And then the diameter right here, that's DS. So just make sure when you attack this chart, if you have a straight shaft, then DB and um, DS are the same. But if you have a belled shaft, DB is just the, the larger diameter, the very bottom of the shaft. Then you can just hit these two um, charts uh, put them into the equation and you can figure out what's the point bear and bearing capacity of your drill shaft. Okay, so we've been talking about just the end bearing. What about friction? What about the frictional resistance of these shafts? We've heard that the friction typically holds more than the end bearing. <clears throat> so, all right, friction. <clears throat> what's going on here? Well, hopefully some of these things look familiar to us again. The, the total friction that the shaft can hold is based off of three components. It's based off of the perimeter, the friction between that concrete and the soil, and then some uh, incremental uh, length parameter. So if your length is 30 feet, then you just multiply your perimeter by your friction by 30 feet. Um, and you can also uh, express it in terms of uh, soil feet, the friction angle and then the, the, the unit weight of the soil. So we understand from last time, we kind of showed that little chart again, after about 15 diameters down into the ground, then it levels off right here. So this is, this point right here is typically 15 times the diameter. And then you get a constant friction value afterwards. So friction, it gets tighter and tighter the deeper that you go, just because the soil is under so much more load. But then at, at 15 times D, it just um, levels out. Doesn't get any, doesn't get any more. So that's that's basically it. There's only one equation to figure out the skin friction. <clears throat> then there was that previous equation to figure out the point end bearing. Those two combined give you your ultimate load of the pile. So let's look at an example together. Is there any questions? Okay, what is this right here? We have, oh, this is awesome. So you can see we've got a belled end. We've got two diameters, the diameter of the belled end and the diameter of the shaft. Looks like we're going down into some loose sand has a unit weight of 16.2 kilonewtons and then it's anchored or socketed into some dense gravel. Looks like it increases the uh, unit weight, and we, we know our friction angle that it's going to embed into. So, what do we got? We've got uh, we're going to use a factor of safety. So, whatever we figure out, um, then we have to whatever the total ultimate load is, then we have to divide it by four, and that will be our allowable load. The diameter of the shaft is going to be one meter, the diameter of the bell is almost twice that 1.75. Here is going to give us the modulus of, uh, of our soil, 500 times the atmospheric pressure. What we're ignoring is skin friction. Okay, so obviously there's going to be no friction. So we're just going to say, what is the end bearing capacity of this pile right here? So how do we do this? What equation do we start with? What page is this on in the book? Let me see if I can find this. because you will have a drilled shaft question on the test and the test is on Friday. So we need to just kind of run through this. I want you to know. So how would you start? Who wants to help me out? Um, 
Page 657. Yes, thank you. Okay, here we are. All right. <clears throat> so, if we go back to that equation that was pretty big, it had three of Terzaghi's components in it. Um, how many of those components are we going to use for this soil right here? We're looking for Q, P, because Q, U is going to equal our Q, P, because we were told, oh man, there is no skin friction. So our goal is to hunt down Q, P. And the very first slides, we were said that that had one, two, three components to it. We typically kill this component and turn it to zero. But there was another component. This was a component that had to do with cohesion. This had to do with the depth and the unit weight. So is there any other component we toss out on this one? Josh, what do you think? It's all sand and no cohesion. There you go. That's it. So yeah, we'll, we'll kill the cohesion one too and turn that to zero. So that's important to know. You have to know that uh, this really simplifies down to quite a bit. And if you look on page 657, uh, QP will now just equal the area times our, um, our load. And then we've got to multiply it by a couple of these, um, these F factors. And so what is Q? Let me write this out. Let me see if I can write this good for you. Well, the area. And so what's going to be the area? It's going to be the area of this drill, of this diameter down here at the bottom. And Q prime. How do we figure out that again right here? Q, what is Q? Q is just, what is that lateral pressure down here at the bottom? So Q is going to be equivalent to six. We're going to start with six meters down times the unit weight of the soil. So Q is going to be equal to six times 16.2. And then we're going to add that to, oh, we've got two more meters of this material. So we've got two times the 19.2. So in order to figure out what is that, what is those lows, what is all of this soil is compacting all these particles together and that compacting of the particles give them strength. And this is how to figure out what that effective stress is uh, down into the ground. We can add all those two together. Sorry, my pen always wigs out, but that's gonna equal 135.6 kilonewtons. So let me just write that real quick. Okay, so we know that Q, whoa, it's supposed to be Q equals 135 kilonewtons. All right, so now we need to figure out what some of these factors are. So the cool, the best way to approach this is, all right, we're just looking at end bearing. So what's the soil that it's bearing in? What's this friction angle? Once we know friction angle, we can figure out a ton of different correlations. So we take this 36 and then we attack those tables. So if we go to table 12.1, that one that I showed you in the very beginning, and we go down to 36, we're able to find out a couple of different things we're able to find out nq and we're able to find out fqs so let's just look at that really quick all right we're coming in here at 36 we know that nq is 37.75 and then we know that fqs equals 1.72 so now let's go back <clears throat> so we we take those values and that's part of them because the equation that we're working with let me go back The equation that we're, we're trying to solve for is right here. This is the equation that we're using. We can figure out an area, because we've got the diameter of the bell shape. We just calculated this as 135. From the table, we can figure out NQ, and we can figure out FQS. So we're almost there. We just need two more values. And where do we get these values? Well, these can be calculated from these equations right here. And so you grab these equations, and the most important one is that where the most mistakes are made is this one right here. If we don't put this value in radians. And so in this case, for our, our problem, we've got one plus 0.247 
Now, where do we get 0.247? How do we know C that was, was 0.247? Well, if you come back to this table, C is 0.247. So we're, we're cruising along. Then it says length over dB. And the catch is to remember for this tangent inverse, that length over the diameter of, the, of dB equals uh, a value in radians. That's the main thing right there. So we've got length is eight, because we had six meters down plus two meters, go back to this. We had, it's gonna be six, total length is six plus two. We know dB is gonna be equal to 1.75. And now we have everything that we need. And then we just plug the rest of those numbers in, calculate it out. And in the end, we would get a value of 6,619 kilonewtons. That's pretty big. I mean, for a diameter that's only, and that's a pretty big diameter though. It's almost five feet diameter, the bell shape. It can hold, a lot of kilonewtons. So that is how you'd crack, how you'd um, figure out just the bearing capacity. Now, if there was skin friction, if we weren't ignoring the skin friction, then we'd have to go back to that equation. It's pretty straightforward. It's just on the previous page right here. And then we'd be able to figure out our skin friction. And then we would add that to it. And then those two together, we would divide by four and that would be our answer. So, um, now there's that shortened equation too that we could use and you'll see that both values give you a, a very um, close answer. So, I mean, that is drilled shafts in a nutshell and this was sand without cohesion. But what if we add cohesion? I just wanna cover this in the next two minutes. Um, we can handle that. Um, there's a couple of equations that we can figure out um, that if, if you're in clay, where you have no friction angle. Uh, in this case, your NQ would be zero. And so that would kill that second component, but this is your first component. Now we have two, we have three components. Well, this one's always gone, but if you have a friction angle that's zero, then this one goes away. And so all you're left is your cohesion one right here. And so we can, um, there's a, again, there's some tables, there's some charts that help us figure out these different values. Um, but it, it, it's a pattern. We've, we've done this before. If, we've, if, everyone, if we ever want to figure out what these modification factors are, um, just follow the really good example in the book and it will help us hunt down these different modification factors. And so really a good engineer takes his cues from those who have actually done real world tests. So if you ever have a chance and you're an engineer and you're designing a foundation that maybe has a hundred drilled shafts in it, one thing that you would have to do is you'd have to probably test 5% of those shafts and you'd have to actually do a, a failure test and you would get your own chart. You wouldn't have to rely on all these other folks. You'd be able to get your own chart right here and you'd be able to back calculate very accurate values. And so that's, that's this book just shows you how others have done it and the charts that they've created based on their field tests, but you would do your own field tests and you would be able to instrument your drilled shaft in a way to get these same values. And then you'd have confidence that what you've done is correct. So one thing that I observed when I was uh, downtown Salt Lake City is I was on the drill rig and we were soil sampling, going down about 150 feet, getting all these um, different SPT values. We we're using a lot of mud rotary. And then there was, I was surrounded by these other crews and they were drilling down their drilled shafts. And when the first drilled shaft was done, they drove some other little shafts next to it so that they could build this reaction pile. And so then they, they loaded this, the very first file, pile to failure. And they pushed in the ground, pushed in the ground. And they had a dial that was measuring how much settlement it had. And then they had another dial that was measuring the load. And you could see the settlement, the load going up, and then the settlement kept going, but then the load started going down and you knew your drill shaft had failed. It had settled so much that now its capacity couldn't hold anymore. And so they were able to get the ultimate capacity of that pile. Then they checked that with their design, it exceeded it a little bit, so they, were, they felt pretty good. And then they, they did hundreds of piles downtown Salt Lake City, but you always gotta do some test pile to give you the confidence um, that what you're doing is correct, so. That test anyway, pass is just put in a place that's they just leave it there out of the way or something. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's kind of over off the side where the other piles are going to go and it stays in the ground forever. They can go in and they can hack off maybe the top 10 feet of it or something like that. 
and then just cover it with soil like it's not even there. So, yeah. All right, well, that's drilled shafts for you, kind of in a nutshell. We'll cover a little bit more on drilled shafts on Wednesday. There's really not much more to cover. What, what we're going to cover next is how strong are these laterally? If you push on a drilled shaft uh, on the side, uh, what kind of loads could you expect it to handle? So we'll cover lateral loads, and then that's it. So email me if you have any questions. Um, work on the homework. If you got any questions for the homework, again, email me. We can go through it together. If we have a little bit of time left over, we can do another problem. I think it would be helpful to do a drill shaft problem in class, similar to the one that's going to be on the test. And if you can do that, you're good to go. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brother Smith. Mm -hmm. Good question, Brother Smith. Yeah. <clears throat>